We are on week two of this series, Divine Direction, and last Sunday, man, I wish we'd have sung that last Sunday. Last Sunday we sang, we talked about uh, the power of the Holy Spirit, this, this free gift that was given to us by Jesus. Jesus said, listen, I'm going to heaven, but I'm not going to leave you on your own. I'm going to send down a comforter, someone who can guide you in your life, and he sent us the Holy Spirit, and we looked at that last week and the power that's with that. We also started talking about our seven core values as a church. How many know if you do not know your values, you cannot know where you're headed? Same applies in your life. If you don't know your convictions, you cannot know where you're going to go in life. And we started talking about these seven core values. And the first two we talked about were that Jesus is our message and that we love people. It was that simple. Jesus is our message and we love people. Jesus said, I'm, I'm leaving, but I'm sending the Holy Spirit to empower you to be witnesses, to share the message of Jesus with all people. Everybody say all. all. With all people. And we looked last week at those things. If you were not here, I'd encourage you strongly uh, to go home and to catch up on the Elevation Point Church app. You can also go to elevationpoint.church slash watch. You can go to Elevation Point. YouTube channel. We have all kinds of avenues there for you to be able to get the word in from last week. I'd encourage you to do that. But I'm excited for this morning. I second what he said about the liquid sunshine. I woke up this morning expecting God to do something great. And I believe that people who got up and said, you know what, it's raining outside, but I still got to get to God's house. I think God's going to do something special. I'm just that type. I just believe that God honors his people that said, you know what, nothing's keeping me out of church today, but I'm going to get to God's house. So, so this morning, I'm excited to see what God's going to say. I believe that he's given me a word uh, to help somebody this morning. Might as well be you. Going to help somebody. Might as well be you. I believe that he's going to help somebody to find some peace in the midst of chaos, to find some peace in the chaotic areas of their lives and I'd ask you to help me preach this thing today. I, I would. I'd ask you to kind of engage with me a little bit. Kind of, church should be interactive. Amen. You know, I grew up, church is interactive. It's, it should be fun. It should not be where we come just to kind of sit and be bored for a couple hours. But church should be interactive and fun. We should always kind of be, you know, if you just give me an amen, I promise I'll get you to lunch a lot quicker. Amen. Just kind of help, help preach me along. I'll get through my, my outline and, and we'll, get to, we'll get to lunch. But... It should be interactive, and, and I believe that if you'll engage, that God will do something amazing in your life. I, I believe that you get out of it what you put into it. A lot of times we come to church, and we sit, and we go home, and we feel the same, but we didn't put anything into the experience. God said, if you'll put something in, then I'll give something back. So I'd encourage you this morning to engage. We're going to look at Daniel chapter number 4. Daniel chapter 4. I don't think I've ever preached out of Daniel in my life. Um, I might have. I don't know. Memory's not quite what it used to be. Sleep deprivation has set in in the Barker household with our newborn child. So there's a good chance I preached out of Daniel 4 before. I just don't remember it. But in Daniel chapter number 4, as you're turning there, they'll be putting it on the screen as well if you don't have your Bible. But we see uh, this guy named King Nebuchadnezzar. And most of the time, even if you've never been to church before or not spent a lot of time in church, you've heard of Nebuchadnezzar to some degree because he's generally looked at in the story with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which were these three guys that he threw into a furnace because they would not bow down to his false idol that he had, this golden, this golden idol. And he threw them into a furnace, and then he looks back in the furnace, and, and there's a fourth person in the furnace. How many believe that, that God's always got you? God is always with you. You got it to where your enemies will look back at you and they'll be like, wait, now there's two of you. I only saw one before. There's four people. There were only three in the beginning. That's where we normally look at Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar is a little bit, a little bit older now, a little bit further on in life. And, and we see a different time for him where he has this dream. He has a dream. And in his dream, he interprets it himself to say that he's going to be victorious and prosperous. He and his kingdom are going to have victory and prosperity when he interpreted it himself. I mean, you know, we get ourselves in a lot of trouble sometimes when we kind of interpret our own things. We need to kind of seek God's guidance first because he thinks he's going to have victory and prosperity. So then he goes to Daniel, who's a man of God, 
and ask him for a second opinion. And the guy and Daniel's like, actually, yes, it's about victory and prosperity. You got that part right. One problem though, it's about the victory and prosperity that your enemies are going to have over you. So Nebuchadnezzar starts to see this thing come to fruition. A lot of people, you know, they say that Nebuchadnezzar and Pharaoh were a lot alike because they both had close encounters with God. God, God gave them warning sign after warning sign after warning sign, and they'd get this close, but they'd never fully step in. You ever known somebody like that? I know you're not that type. Where you kind of, they kind of stepped in, but they never could fully commit to the ways of the Lord. And, and that's kind of how Nebuchadnezzar was. He, he had all these warning signs, but he never fully committed to the one and only true God until all of this stuff starts happening. And his dream starts coming to pass and starts coming true. And, and he starts losing his royalty. Bible even says that he had to graze in the grass like an ox. Can you imagine this? Like picture this for a moment. This great king, this powerful king who has commanded people to death. That's how powerful he was. If he spoke it, then somebody had to do it or else they would die. And now he's out like grazing grass. I don't think you can graze grass standing on your feet. I think you got to get down literally like an animal to graze in the grass. This man of, of, of such great magnitude is now being humbled and and he finally acknowledges God as the one and only true Lord, the most high God. And it says in, in verse number 34 of Daniel chapter 4, at the end of that time, everybody say that time. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the most high and I honored and glorified him who lives forever. It's torn if you, if you kind of study theologically and everything. I won't bore you with all that kind of stuff because I don't even like having to study that stuff. I don't would sit up here and bore you with it. But if you study it, they're kind of torn on whether or not Nebuchadnezzar truly acknowledged God as his Lord. If he ever gave his life to the Lord. I personally think, just personal opinion, I wouldn't like bet my life on it, that he did in this moment. Because he acknowledged him as the most high God. Who lives forever. And before he had just called him a God. Now he calls him the most high God. So, so I like to give the benefit of the doubt. I like to see that the glass is, is half full, not half empty. Uh, when it comes to people going to heaven. Because I, I, I don't want anybody to not go to heaven. So my prayer is that this was a moment where Nebuchadnezzar had that realization. But it says his dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. And all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of this earth. No one. Say no one. Tell your neighbor, I know you've been in the gym, but not even you. No one. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? King Nebuchadnezzar is in a moment where anyone would have lost their sanity. Anyone would have lost their mind. He's in a moment where he's losing everything. You cannot blame Nebuchadnezzar. We look at Bible characters all the time because we've got the whole book. We look at Bible characters and we're like, man, I can't believe that they lost their mind. Don't they know it's going to get better? No. Did you know that, that your situation you went through last year was going to get better when you were freaking out about it? No. But if you were to look back now in retrospect, you're like, eh, maybe overreacted a little bit. Might not be that big of a deal that the electric bill was $20 over. We're going to make it. But Nebuchadnezzar, he's losing his mind, and nobody can blame him. Because can you imagine being in this moment where, where everything that was familiar to you is starting to disappear? Can you imagine being in this moment where where everything that you've known is starting to go away, where, where your name and your identity is being tarnished, where you're starting to feel as if it's all over, where people turn their backs on you. Maybe you don't even have to like imagine it because maybe you've lived it. It's like too real on a Sunday morning. I don't know. I'm going to try it over here. Maybe you've lived that before. 
Or maybe you're even living it today where it's like, what is going on? And when you're in those moments, it is so easy, so easy to feel as if you're never going to recover. As if it's never going to get better. It's easy to question everything. It's easy to wonder why. And I came to tell you today that that's okay. That's okay. I think one of the reasons that people give up in life a lot of times is because we think we have to be okay all the time. I have to always be okay. I mean, you, you, being in ministry, you feel that way. I got to always have a smile. Everything always has to be okay, man, because otherwise, you know, people start asking questions and think it's always got to be okay. But the truth is, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to not be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. Because God desires for his children that we have life and have it more abundantly. So he says, you come to me when it's not okay, and I'm going to make it okay. So for this week of divine direction, I want to talk to you about how we as a church and in our lives, how we can get our sanity restored. That's the title of my message today. If you want to write that down, sanity restored. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for today. And I thank you for, for this house and, and for those watching online and, and that we're just engaging in what you're saying today, that we're going to lean into what you're saying. I pray that you would help everybody to hear what they need to hear from you today. It can be different for every single person based on one word. I pray that you would help them to see you and to hear from you, not to see and to hear from me. And I thank you for it today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Now, have you ever done this? Have you ever made a purchase that seemed like a good purchase, but then it had hidden consequences? Anybody that I show hands can make me not feel so bad about myself today. You made a purchase, like, like you bought a house for cheap, but then it turned into a money pit, and, and you weren't that great at fixing things, and you had to pay to have everything fixed. Or, or maybe, I don't know, you bought some shampoo for cheap one time, and it caused all your hair to fall out. I'm not talking out of experience. I'm just saying it could have happened sometime to somebody. I don't know. But, but last August, I made a purchase that I thought was a great purchase. And to be honest with you, I still think it was a good I would make it again. Ten out of ten times, I'd make the same purchase. But if I'm being real with you all today, it had some hidden consequences that I wasn't expecting. Talking about when I bought my lifted truck. People, they always stop me out, and they're like, Hey, man, I don't know anything about trucks. Let me just throw that out there. I bought a truck. I don't know anything about them. And, and people are like, man, what's the lift on that truck? I'm like, tall. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm glad to have it because my wife has a hard time getting into the truck, so I'm able to help her into the truck. But, but anyways, don't judge me. <clears throat> so I got this lifted truck, and, and I didn't know anything about trucks, but I bought it. My grandmother, she's even like, BB's like, listen, man. I never, she doesn't say listen man because I talk that way, but she said, Dustin, I never thought the day would come that I'd see you in a truck and living on a farm. And I'm like, well, BB, people surprise you. You know what I'm saying? People surprise you. But I think the reason it was so shocking was because every car I've had before this truck was a two-door coupe. My whole life. Well, that I've owned cars, so for the past 10, 11 years, every car was a two-door coupe. And my last car was this blue Subaru BRZ. But there was no way on God's green earth that I was going to put a car seat into the back of a two-door car. Especially with this dude getting as big as he is now and as heavy as he is now. I'm not trying to finagle this thing into the back of the car. That's one reason I got the truck. The other reason I got the truck is because we live on this farm now. And you got to act like you know what you're doing. If you have something in your house that says Barker Farms, you need to act like you're farming. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well, now i got a truck. And I really got tired of having to ask people for their trucks to borrow to do things. You know, because, again, you got to have activity going on around the farm, even if it's just picking up a little clump of dirt and putting it in the back of the truck. But I needed to borrow somebody's truck to do it. I didn't want to have to ask anybody for help all the time. So I, I was like, I need a truck. And I was not going to be one of those people that, that had a little car with the trunk open, the back seats down, and a 2 by 20 going through the car all the way. I don't even know if a 2 by 20 is a real thing, but we're going to act like it is. Going all the way through the car, hanging out the back trunk. I, wasn't gonna, I, I just wasn't going to do it. 
So I made this purchase. And I was proud of this purchase because I was patient. And I am not a patient person. But I was patient. And I took my time and I did my research. And I found a good deal. A good deal. It wasn't even on, it wasn't even on the lot yet. But I found it online before they ever even took the official pictures. And I got out there and I looked at it because it looked cool. Which is all that mattered to me. If you're going to get a truck, get a truck. That's what the guy said to me this week. He, he told me and dad, he was like, you're going to get a truck, get a truck. So I bought this truck, and I was proud of myself for making this great purchase. I got a great deal on it. And I was all proud. I made that purchase without my wife, so I, it needed to be a good purchase. I mean, I sent her pictures, but she's working. I mean, I work too, but her schedule is a lot more strict than mine. Let me clarify. But I, I, I get home, and I'm all excited about this purchase, and I'm all proud to show off this purchase. And, and I'm feeling good about myself because I have... A man vehicle. You know what I'm saying? Like, I put away the boy car. I got a man truck. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. And I had a two-door coupe. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And I bought a truck. I bought this truck. And I'm proud of it. And I'm like, our son wasn't born yet. But I was like, when, he gets, when he's born, he's going to love this truck. That's true. He, he falls asleep in it all the time. But I bought this truck, and I'm so excited. I got this. I got my dad mobile, which is actually a cool one, because I'm never going to drive a minivan. No offense if you do. It's just personal preference. <laughs> Don't worry. In 10 years, I'll probably be driving a minivan. But for right now, I can say what I want. And so I'm pulling into the driveway, and I'm feeling good about myself. You ever just been feeling yourself? You know what I mean? Like, you got the music blaring in the car. You're feeling good. You got the windows down. And I go to pull into the garage, and Nicole's standing at the door or whatever of the garage, and, and I'm, I'm looking to my side, you know, and in front of me trying to make sure I can fit it in there. And it's going good. But then I look at Nicole and she's just kind of going like this. And I'm like, no, it's, it's, but then I look up. And when I looked up, I realized this truck's not going to fit. This truck is not about to fit in the garage. And one of the reasons we bought this house was because it had an attached garage. And now I have to park it outside. So I'm trying to fit this truck, this new truck, into this old garage, and it's not fitting. Because a lot of times in life, we try to fit new things into old places, and we wonder why it's not working. But I go, and I try to fit it in, and then the last moment I look up, and I realized it wasn't going to fit. So we had to pay. I say had to pay. May not really had to, but to me, we had to pay to have our garage door raised and to get new garage doors. So now this great deal on a truck that I got is no longer a great deal because we had to pay just to fit it into the garage. That was my unknown consequence. But when I went to pull it into the garage, I'm looking everywhere, and it's working perfectly. But the moment I raised my eyes, I saw that I wasn't going to make it in. And if I would not have looked up, then I would have wrecked the truck. And the first thing I need you to see today is in our lives, we got to raise our eyes. In your life, you got to raise your eyes. Nebuchadnezzar said in verse 30 and 34, he said, At the end of that time, I raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Many of us are so busy looking at the chaos going on around us that we're missing the provision above us. We're so busy at looking at everything going on that, around us that we're struggling with that we're missing it all. And there comes a time in life when you have to stop looking all around you and you even have to stop looking forward and you have to raise your eyes. You got to look up. Nebuchadnezzar, he, he's in the midst of losing it all. He's in the midst of losing everything. And he's lost his sanity. And no doubt he's angry He's afraid, he's confused, but the moment that he raised his eyes, the peace of God came into his heart. The moment that he raised his eyes, he said, my sanity was restored. It did not say that I got everything back. It said my sanity was restored because sometimes you have to get your sanity before you can get it back. He raised his eyes and his sanity was restored. Now when he looked around him, all he saw was confusion and chaos and heartache and stress and disappointment. But the moment he raised his eyes, he got his peace. 
I don't know. Have you ever been there before? I don't know if I'm in the right place today or not. But like, have you ever been there where everywhere you look is a mess? Everywhere you look is chaos. Nothing's making sense. Nothing's working out. It's no wonder, to be honest with you, that we struggle to keep our sanity today. It's no wonder. Because we're constantly confronted with, with emails, with work, with our marriages, with our children, with the news. I don't even look at the news anymore. I mean, if, if the world collapses, it's okay. I'm going to heaven. I can't look at it anymore. It stresses me out. I'm like, I don't even, I don't, I care, but I don't. Like, I care, but I can't look at it today because it just, it's always something. And it's no wonder that we lose our sanity because we're constantly looking at all these things, which is why it's so important that first thing every morning, you raise your eyes. First thing every morning, you look up, not looking at your phone, not looking at your text messages, your emails, the news, but that you raise your eyes. And I'm preaching to myself because the other day, I read my email before I, I did anything, before I prayed, before I read my Bible, before I even acknowledged that God existed, I read my email. Because my alarm clock went off, I reached over, which is my phone, I grabbed my phone, and I pulled it, and I had an email there, and I was like, huh, let's see what this is about. And I opened the email before I ever raised my eyes. And it completely wiped out my entire day. I don't know if you've ever gotten one of those emails. Like, I'm not being oversensitive, it just wiped out my whole day. Before the day ever even started, I hadn't even put a foot on the ground yet, and my feel defeated in the bed. Before I ever moved. Because I read my email before I even acknowledged my source. I started reading emails about my resources. See, when you start reading things about your resources and you're not acknowledging the source, you're going to get stressed out. But when you go to your source first, then you know no matter what happens with my resources, I'm still okay because the source is not going anywhere. So before I ever did anything... I read this email, and it completely wiped out my day. Now, would the email have been there later? Yes. Would I have read it? Yes. But if I would have read it after I had raised my eyes, then I would have read it with a different perspective. See, life is all about perspective. You ever wonder how two people can go through the same type of situation, and one of them, it wipes them out, and the other one keeps going? Because of their perspective. It's how they see it. And if I would have raised my eyes first, my perspective would have been completely different when I read the email. Some of y'all are like, you know what, it's okay. I, I, I don't read my emails, Pastor Dustin. I just uh, I check Facebook, Instagram, and it's okay because everybody that I follow loves Jesus. So they're posting like inspirational, motivational Jesus things. So I don't have to read my Bible first because I get my inspiration and my Jesus from Facebook and Instagram. And that's cool. Like, I get it. Like, that you follow, you only follow Christians. I get it. You only follow people that love Jesus and post positive things. But, but even if that's the case, you also follow people who intentionally or unintentionally, it does not matter, they post things that make you feel sorry about yourself. They post things that make you feel bad about yourself or the life that you're living. Because they post this, this beautiful picture of their proposal, and they just got engaged, and you're sitting over here, and they're 10 years younger than you, and you've been waiting to get married, and God hadn't sent you anybody, and now they're engaged, and you're thinking your time's up because they posted a picture of it before you ever started your day. Don't let me come down your alley somewhere. I can I start pointing out people. You start seeing these things. I would never do that. You start seeing these things, though, and you see these pictures, and it's like, man, they got what I want, but you don't see the whole picture because they cropped it. They cropped it. You don't see the fact that you've been saying, I'm waiting for a man of God, and they settled for somebody that wasn't there. You don't see the fact that you say, I've been waiting for, for somebody who saw the value in me and started trying to pull it out instead of somebody who was trying to take advantage of me. But that's what they settled for. You don't see all that. You just see the fact they got engaged. So before your day ever even starts, because you did not raise your eyes, you start feeling as if your life is over. 
and I'm going to die alone. Or you start seeing, you start seeing that somebody posted a baby announcement. They're having a baby. This is a real thing, y'all. They're having a baby. And it's like, I'm happy for you. But I, we've been believing for a kid for, for four years. And we haven't seen it yet. But it's a crop photo because you don't know they've been trying for 10. And that the day finally came. And they're not trying to shove it in your face. They're just saying, look what God can do for us. If he can do it for us, he can do it for somebody else. And, and you could see it that way. You could see it with that perspective if you raised your eyes first. But because the first thing you saw was a baby announcement without the right perspective, you start thinking that you're never going to be able to have a child. It's all about your perspective. How do you see what you're going through? It's about your perspective. You got to make sure that in your life, the perspective that you have and whatever that you're going through, that you've raised your eyes, that you have looked up and said, you know what, before I even start my day, I have to get the right perspective. I have to get the right thing in my heart. And he looked around him, and all he saw was this chaos. He saw this destruction. But Nebuchadnezzar said, I got to raise my eyes. I got to raise my eyes. He had never done it before. He didn't know what he was doing. But something in him said, I have to raise my eyes. I have to raise my eyes. It is so important that you raise your eyes. It is so important that you look up. Because your life is dictated through the lens that you see it through. And many of us are looking at it through the wrong lens. And we're wondering why we are upset with our life and why we don't like our life. But everything that we're looking at is the wrong lens. Some of us are sabotaging ourselves and our sanity because we're looking at it through the wrong lens. We fail to raise our eyes. We refuse to raise our eyes. And let me just say this. Let me just say this. Just because you raise your eyes, just because you look up, it does not mean that everything automatically gets better. Some of us, we raise our eyes one time. When things don't get better, we quit. No, Nebuchadnezzar said, I raised my eyes and I got my sanity back, even though nothing else in my life was going the way that I wanted it to. He raised his eyes. And when you raise your eyes, it may not fix your situation. I'm not saying you won't still have to go through a mess. I'm not saying life won't still be hard. I'm just saying you'll be sane while you do it. I'm just saying that when you go through it, because you've raised your eyes, it'll give you the peace and the confidence and the strength that you need in order to make it through your life. Nebuchadnezzar, he said, I raised my eyes. I raised my eyes and immediately my sanity was restored before anything else in my life changed. But look what he said next. He said in the second part of verse 34, he said, Then I praised the Most High. And I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Next thing I need you to see is our church's third core value. See, we have Jesus as our message. We love people. But the next thing is, at Elevation Point Church, generations unite. Generations unite. Don't shout me down now. Generations unite. He said, it endures, your kingdom, God, endures from generation to generation. From one generation to the next generation. Not just the younger generation, not just the older generation, but from generation to generation. This is why the devil fights so hard to bring division to the generations of the church. Because he knows that if he can bring division to our generations, that he can stop our growth. If he can bring division to our generations, then he can put a halt on God's kingdom. That's supposed to go from generation to generation. It does not stop with my generation. It does not stop with your generation. But it goes into the next generation. Because his kingdom is from generation to generation to generation to generation. It doesn't stop. It doesn't quit. It's not about being the old church. It's not about being the new church. It's about being the church. 
Every single generation is making up the kingdom of God that cannot be brought down, that will go on from now until forever. And it does not matter who's on this earth and what generation is running it, but God is still supreme. From generation to generation. Tell somebody, generation to generation. Only the devil, I'm going to tread lightly, but I'm going to say it. Only the devil tries to bring division. If somebody's talking to you and they're trying to say something that's bringing division, it's not of God. I don't care how many times they said the Lord told me this. If it's trying to bring division, it is not God. Because God would never try to bring division to his own household. He's not bipolar. He didn't send his son to die so that we could come together just to come and break it apart. If somebody is speaking to vision, it's not coming from God. He's the only one. The, the enemy's the only one because he knows that if he can bring division, if he can get us focused on those things, then he can stop our goal of reaching as many people for Jesus as we possibly can. But he can also stop us from experiencing the best life that God has for us. Because the greatest life that God has for you is not just with your generation, but it's with all of us together. Because we need each other. We need each other. We all, all need each other. It's not just about you. It's not just about them. It's not about the younger generation. It's not about the older generation. We all need each other. The younger generation needs the older generation. The older generation needs the younger generation. We all need each other. And if you want to see who somebody truly is, then look at how they treat somebody they think they don't need. This applies for... Whatever you want it to apply for, but it definitely applies for all generations. As a younger generation, you have to realize the importance of the generation that came before you and what they can put into your life. As an older generation, we have to realize that even though we're getting older, we still can make an impact in the next generation. And what they're going to do could be a legacy for you even when you're not here. I personally do not want my life and my legacy to end when I die. I want it to go on. I want people to be able to say, you know what, Dustin invested so much in the next generation that had nothing really to do with him, that nothing that they could give him, but he invested in them so that they could get to a place where the kingdom of God could be stronger when he left this earth than it was while he was here. We need each other. We all need each other. We need the, we need the wisdom of those who have gone before, and we need the passion and the energy of the next generation. We need it all. Psalm 145.4 says that one generation shall commend to the next the mighty works of God and shall declare his great acts. One generation to the other. One to another. Not one generation to themselves, but from one generation to another, they shall declare who God is and the mighty things that he has done. And it is time for us to unite multiple generations so that we can accomplish all that God wants us to accomplish. Amen. Stay quiet. I'm going to stay here all day. It is time for us to unite and to say, I don't even understand why you dress that way. I don't understand why your music's that way. I don't understand how you're trying to hold on to where it came from. I don't understand all these things, but we got to work together. Because we're stronger together. We can do more together. We can accomplish more together than we ever could apart. This is why we're so excited about our future offering coming up on May 6th. You have it on your chair. But we have our future offering coming up on May 6th, and we're excited because we have the opportunity as a church, as a collective community, to invest in the next generation. We have an opportunity to come together and to collectively invest in the next generation and to say that we want to create a place that is safe for you to be able to grow and to continue to learn about Jesus just like we are. We want to create a place for you that you can see everything that God wants to do in your life. Just like somebody believed in me when I was seven years old and said, I want to invest in you. I want to invest in the next generation. 
I want to see what God's going to do in our young people. I believe that our young people are going to be a mirror that reflects what we put into them. A lot of times we want to talk about the next generation without doing something about it. If you want to talk about the next generation, step up and say, I'm going to invest in the next generation. I'm going to be part of the difference in the next generation. I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to make a difference. At Elevation Point Church, we, we believe that generations need to unite, but we also are a place where cultures align. Cultures align. That's the fourth core value that I need you to see. Cultures align. Because Nebuchadnezzar, he said, all the people. Everybody say all. all. See, when y'all get quiet on me, I start making you talk. Everybody say all. all. I won't do it again. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? All the peoples of the earth, all the peoples, we are all equal. All of us are equal. All the peoples of the earth. He said, all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. It is God and then it's us. It's not God and then white, black, yellow, brown. It is God and then it's us. He said, all the peoples of the earth, all of us, we are all equal in God's eyes. We are all the same. So we will not be a white church. We will not be a black church. We will not be a Hispanic church. We will not be an oriental church. But we will be the church because we're better together. We can accomplish more together. We can make a greater difference together. When cultures align under what God has purposed, we are unstoppable. We're unstoppable when we align together. Elevation Point Church, we align together. We are cultures aligning together. And some people, they try to say that denominations are the biggest division in the kingdom. And that's a separate conversation. But to be honest with you, and I hate to have to break this, but two of the greatest divisions that the enemy works so hard to bring into the church are generationally and culturally. Statistically proven, it's generational and cultural. It's they don't want anything to do with me because I'm too old, and they don't want anything to do with me because I'm too young, and they don't want anything to do with me because I'm not the right color of skin. It's generational and it's cultural. Those are two of the greatest divisions. And the enemy knows that if he can get us to focus on those things and the differences that are there, he can cause us to lose our sanity. Which is why it's so important that we raise our eyes. Because when we raise our eyes, we can see that while we're all different, we're not different. While we're all different, we're the same. Because we have the same DNA. And we have the same Heavenly Father. And we have the same mission and the same goal that we are striving for together. Doesn't matter where you came from, doesn't matter if you're different than I am, it doesn't, none of that matters. Because we have the same Father. Same Father. The same goal. We're on the same mission to see how many people we can reach for Jesus, to see how we can better live our lives for Jesus. It does not matter where you come from. We have the same goal. I don't know how, how y'all are, like when, I don't know what GPS y'all use. I know none of y'all actually really get around on your own. I, don't, I know I don't. My dad does. He can drive anywhere. He could probably drive to California like he's got his atlas in the back of the car. Me personally, I use a GPS. And, and my GPS of choice is Waze. Found out last night that somebody in our family calls it Waze. <laughs> it is not Waze. It is Waze. Sometimes, I'm just going to say this, and, and I can say it because I have the microphone. Sometimes, you know, if we would just humble ourselves and ask the younger generation <laughs> how to properly do something or how to say something, I'm, I mean, I'm talking to myself. I don't, I, there's so many things I don't even understand, and I just ask because it just helps you look better if you'll ask. But anyways, I use ways. 
And, and the reason that I use Waze or Waze, whatever you... Yeah. That's one thing I do appreciate about the older generation is that they, they know how to make things nice. They said, we're going to take Waze, we're going to make it Waze. It's no longer Waze. It's Waze. But I like using Waze because it'll tell you when the popo's up ahead. You know, people will tell you that there's a, there's a police officer, he's trying to radar for you. And he'll tell you when there's traffic and all this kind of stuff. So I use Waze. Now, this is my Waze right here, okay? And I'm going to put in here that I want to go to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse after lunch because dad's buying. And <clears throat> so I want to go to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. And, and if I put in here that I want to go, all right, it's going to, it's going to calculate and it's going to tell me how I can get to Ruth's Chris. Now, this is telling me to go via US 78 West to I-85 I South. But there's this button right here that says Routes. Okay? I know you probably can't see it, but just trust me. There's a button that says Routes. And if you click on Routes, it pops up and says Calculating Alternate Routes. And now it tells me I can go 78 to 85. I can go Sugarloaf Parkway to I-85. I can go Ronald Reagan Parkway to Beaver Ruin Road to I-85. Now I have three options. And if I choose the second one, I'm still going to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. Isn't that crazy? Like I just changed the route, but it still has me going to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. It's the same destination it's just a different route. It's the same destination. It's just a different way to get there. See, your generation may be different than mine. Your generation may be different than your neighbors. Your culture may be different than mine. Your culture may be different than your neighbors. But we have the same destination. We have the same goal. We are headed in the same way. We have the same things in mind. We have the same common goal. It does not matter how you're planning to get there, but we're going to the same place. So I don't know what you have in your mind that you're wanting to do or how you've gotten to where you are or how you're planning to get where you're wanting to go, but I believe that we can do it together because even though it may be a different route, your background may be different than mine, God's given us the same destination as a church. He's given us the same vision as a church in the same direction as a church our sanity in our lives and as a church can only be maintained if we raise our eyes if we raise our eyes because when we start looking at everything going on around us that's when confusion sets in that's when we start questioning like do I really fit in here well are you a child of God yes then you fit in do, do I really, can I really hang with these young bucks? Are you a child of God? Do you have some wisdom that you can impart into the next generation? Yes, you can hang with the young bucks. It does not matter what year you were born. I don't care if it was 1930. I don't care if it was 1950. I don't even care if it was 2010. You have a role to play in Elevation Point Church because God's kingdom is not about culture. It's not about generation, but it's about one mission. And it's about what God has for us. As a church, as a church, my family, my like blood family, is not all made up of 28-year-olds. My family is made up of my parents, my grandparents, and now a son and my wife. So we have multiple generations. And you know what? When I have a question to do something that my wife can answer, I go to her. I don't go to Judah yet because he doesn't know how to talk. But if I have something that I need some wisdom on from some life experiences, I go to my parents. And if they can't answer it, I go to my grandparents because they all play a role in my life. Every single one of us plays a role in the life of God's kingdom. We all have a role to play. We all have something to do. And we will not be a church where we sit down because we feel like we don't have what it takes. God has empowered every single one of us through the Holy Spirit to do whatever we got to do to reach God's children. We are on the same team. 
We're on the same. Tell somebody, tell them, look at them and say, what's up, teammate? What's up, teammate? We're on the same team. We're on the same team. Y'all stand up all over this place. I'll keep going. We're on the same team. If God has called you to Elevation Point Church, he called you to Elevation Point Church because we're a place where we work together. Every generation matters. Every culture matters. Every background matters. I don't care if you were at the club on drugs last Friday night. You're in God's house at Elevation Point Church, and we believe that God can get you connected and you can have a role to play. We have to stop disqualifying people from playing a role in God's kingdom. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God, we thank you this morning that that we're a part of a community where everybody plays a part. We thank you that we're a place where every single generation, every single culture, every single background, everyone is important and everyone matters and everyone has what it takes to do what you have called them to do in this place, in your kingdom. God, that's what the church is all about, not just Elevation Point, but all churches. That's what it should all be about. It's a place where we can collectively come together for a common mission of connecting people to God and to others. I'm going to do something a little different this morning with every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to talk to anyone in this place today that has felt disqualified. I want to talk to anybody who feels like you're too old, anybody who feels like they're too young, anybody who feels like they messed up too much in their life, anybody who feels like they, they don't have the right color of skin, they've been told that they can't do anything great because of the color of their skin. I want to talk to some people this morning who have felt disqualified. And I'm not just talking about at church now. I'm talking about in your life. Talking about on your job, talking about raising your children, you may feel like a disqualified mother, you may feel like a disqualified father. But I want to talk to people who feel disqualified from fulfilling the purpose that God has given them in their lives. And with every head bowed and every eye closed in this place, I want to, you feel disqualified this morning, I want you to raise your hand to just say, I cancel the disqualification. I cancel the disqualification because starting today, I acknowledge that in him I am qualified to do all things. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you say, I cancel the disqualifications that the enemy has tried to bring in my life, if you would slip your hand right up and right back down. Hands up all over this place. See, none of us are alone. None of us are alone. We're all in this together. We're all trying to figure life out together. We're all in God's kingdom together. And it is so important to know that none of us are exempt from the grace of God. If somebody's told you that you have messed up too much for God's love, they haven't read the same Bible as anybody else because God said that while you were yet a sinner, Christ loved you enough to come and die on the cross for you. God, this morning we cancel the disqualifications. God, we cancel the generational disqualification. We cancel the, the cultural disqualification. We cancel the disqualification that says I've messed up too much. We cancel the disqualification that says I'm all washed up. We cancel the disqualification that says nobody cares what I have to say. We cancel the disqualification of the enemy today. We cancel it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, you know what, I'm not too proud to admit that that the enemy has convinced me that I'm disqualified from God's love through salvation. Because of my past church experiences, because of what I've done before, because of what I've heard before, I don't even believe 
that I could be loved enough by Jesus to come and die for me. It was for everybody else. It wasn't for me. I'm disqualified from that. I'm too messed up. And that's what I've always felt in my life. But something today as you were preaching, Pastor Dustin, just helped me feel that there was still hope in my life. That there was still a love greater than anything I've ever imagined. And today I want to commit my life to Jesus. I'm like Nebuchadnezzar. I, I say all these other little idols that I've been worshiping, these temptations, these things I've struggled with, the alcohol addiction, the drug addiction, the pornography addiction, all these things that I've been struggling with, I put them aside for the one and only most high God. And today I commit my life. I want to commit my life to him. And if you're here today and you'd say, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to recommit my life to him. If you would, just slip your hand right up and right back down. Nothing to be ashamed about. This is a proud moment. Yes, 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 yes. I want us to first pray this prayer together for those who lifted our hands saying that we have to have salvation in our lives. Lord Jesus, I thank you for loving me. I thank you that I am not disqualified, but that in you, I am qualified. Thank you for sacrificing your life so that I might have true life. Forgive me of all my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. In Jesus' name, starting today, I live the rest of my life for you and you alone. Amen. Now I want to pray for those of us who feel disqualified in other areas of our lives. God, I thank you this morning. That when Jesus came and died on the cross, he did not just die for our salvation. But I thank you that when he came and he died, he bled and was crucified to pay for our disqualifications. And to qualify us in every situation. I thank you that none of us are disqualified. I thank you that none of us are too messed up. None of us are too jacked up. None of us are too lost. None of us have done too much wrong. None of us have the wrong generation. None of us have the wrong culture. But God, in you, because of the sacrifice of your son, we are all on level playing ground. And I pray, Lord, that today you would help each and every person in this place that walked in here feeling disqualified, that you would help them to feel the qualification that you are putting back in their lives. As a church on their jobs, as a mother, as a father, in their families, whatever it may be. God, we thank you that you do not call the qualified, but that you have qualified the called. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. Now put your hands together this morning if you're thankful for a qualifying Savior. Amen. Come on, we can do better than that. How many are thankful in this place today?